Ms. Fiedler. May it please the court. Um, first, let me express um, my appreciation for the court's continued hospitality as this is the fourth time that we've been here on this case. Um, yet this is the first time that the plaintiff has been the appellant. Um, our work on all the other appeals was necessitated by the fact that the defendants um, um, appealed and we were there just to defend the relief that we'd been granted. Um, in Lee 3, this court instructed that the defendants could not be liable for fees that were obviously incurred in pursuing the unsuccessful claims for money damages. As I understood the opinion, it was not so much that the plaintiff had unsuccessful claims that were not part of a common set of facts. It was simply that the 11th Amendment, <coughs> um, there were 11th Amendment problems in holding the state responsible for fees related to money damages that turned out to have been barred by sovereign immunity. And you emphasize the district court's discretion basically saying that the court could make its decision um, using whatever method made the most sense. But the district court abused its discretion when it came up with a way to decide this issue um, in a way that made no rational sense at all. Let me ask you about that because, you know, as I kind of got into the district court's opinion, there did seem to be a, a, at least a piece of it it really made some sense to me, and that was the court said, well, the immunity issue, that's about 20% of the case, and you lost on that. And actually, you took the appeal in Lee 1. You won at the Court of Appeals, and then it was reversed here, as I recall. Am I, is, that, is that correct? No, we, we did not appeal Lee okay. 1. Okay, all right. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, involved in that. But anyhow, that, it, 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 at least through that first appeal, you were really, uh, I mean, the court said you were really on the wrong track because you were saying there's, uh, that Congress had overridden the immunity uh, under the 11th Amendment, and in fact it hadn't. And then at the end of Lee 1, we put in this uh, language at the end of our opinion saying, if you, uh, you may be entitled or there might be relief under Ex parte Young, which was really something that you had not pursued uh, prior to that in the case, and then you, went on under ex parte young and, and you prevailed and, and so forth. But really, if you'd been on the wrong, the, the right track from the beginning, all of that first appeal would have been unnecessary. And maybe one could say all of, the, all of that time at least, all of the time devoted to the immunity issue should be removed. What, what's your response there? I have several responses to that. First of all, that was not this court's direction in Lee 3. This court's direction was you are to take the, the fees that were obviously incurred in seeking money damages and take those out of the equation. It did not say, um, it did not take the issues in terms of um, liability or the way we found, uh, the way we got to the result. It, excuse me, the court made the differentiation in the relief, whether or not the relief was related to money damages in particular, and that, that, re that those hours should go. And it turns out those hours were only 7.1 hours in the whole case. But if you look at Lee 3, it was based on a, a fee application of 293,000 or 280 not your new application of 366. I'm getting confused because I've got all these issues going on with, with um, the other question. The court in Lee 3 made it very clear that the district court should figure the fees based on all the normal case law that follows um, such an application. One of the main cases um, in that is Hensley, which says, um, among other things, directly says, that if the plaintiff recovers um, injunctive relief, but not that, as long as there was still significant um, uh, success in the case as a whole, that should not affect the damages awarded. One of the other main principles of fee litigation is that 
you should use current hourly rates, especially the longer time has elapsed since the, the plaintiff started working on the case. This is a case that's been going on for 13 years now. It would have been an abuse of discretion if the court had not used current hourly rates and the defendants, um, if, they, if they did object to that, um, I don't believe they even did. They, they came very close to just agreeing that obviously current hourly rates should be used. That would naturally make the amount higher. This court never said in Lee 3, you have to cut the, literally, the amount of the fees. If, if it would have done so, um, that would have meant that we were doing all the rest of the work on the case for free, which I don't think that was this court's intention. Well, you know, in, in Lee 3, our disposition order said, um, on remand, the district court should enter an order awarding Lee fees and costs she incurred in seeking prospective relief in accordance with the principles as set forth below. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, listen to Judge Mansfield's question, um, all that, that stuff trying to get um, outside of In Ray Young did not go to prospective relief. Here's another principle of fee litigation. And that is that the plaintiff <coughs> should be compensated for all hours reasonably expected to be expended on the issues. That if a reasonable lawyer would have taken the position that the plaintiff's counsel took, then the plaintiff's counsel should be compensated for those fees. And in 2005, 2007, no reasonable attorney on earth would not have contended that the 11th Amendment was waived um, or was abrogated by Congress in the FMLA. Hibbs had just been decided in which the Supreme Court held that there was no 11th Amendment immunity for the family care provisions of the FMLA. And all the signs indicated that the ruling was gonna be the but exact same. But isn't that same. a principle that fees reasonably expended in support of successful claims. I mean, uh, nobody's gonna have an issue that you're gonna get a substantial fee award, including the state. I mean, the issue is sort of how much, and it, it does seem to me that you were kind of, maybe it wasn't your fault, but you were barking up the wrong tree until this court came in and said, there's this ex parte young thing, and then at that point, you turned around and argued for prospect for prospective relief, including. We'd always including argued the, for prospective. Well, relief. I mean, there were two members of this court thought that you really your case should be over at that point. I wasn't one of them, but it wasn't. It was a close run thing. I mean, it was the case was almost over at that point. Uh, so, you know, what's wrong with why was it an abuse of discretion for the court to consider that and also consider the fact that you're, you were asking for your current rates and not the rates that you were actually charging at the time and to say, well, I'll reduce it by 40%. I don't think that the, the district court, there's any indication that the district court considered the fact that we were using higher rates in deciding the 40% reduction. Um, I think the 40% reduction was based on 20% where the court said, um, listen, we think that's the appropriate percentage for the request for retrospective relief. But then the court decided there were five issues in the case, and one of those issues was attorney's fees itself. And in this circular bit of reasoning, the court said, okay, I don't think the plaintiff was successful in the request for attorney's fees because in this very order on attorney's fees, I'm going to cut her attorney's fees by 40%. That was not part of the Supreme, of your instructions in Lee 3. Your instruction in Lee 3 was to make a reasonable deduction for hours that specifically were expended in getting retrospective relief. And I think we can fairly debate what our okay, remand, and I think, you make, I think you make a reasonable point. I, I will say I didn't contemplate when I signed on to Lee 3, I didn't envision that you would go back and ask for more money for the fees you had already billed because you now would want to charge for your current rates. I, that, but 
I, you know, so again, the, the remand didn't cover every single point, and that's why we're here, isn't it? We had asked for our higher rates on the second attorney fee application as well, and at that point, the, the court did not grant that. But given the number of years that had passed, um, I think that was appropriate. Um, the other C counsel, if um, we determine the fee award needs to be adjusted, um, would you rather have our court do it or yes. send it? Send it, okay, or send it back for maybe a Lee five. Um, I would. I think um, I'm not. I would not um, be mistaken if I think both parties would like you to take care of the whole thing. Um, the. The other thing that um, I want, I would ask you to recall is that in the state's appeal in 2014, they failed to preserve error on any argument that the fee should be reduced um, for any reason at all. And this court held that despite that, um, it wasn't fair to hold the state responsible for fees related to a claim for which they had 11th Amendment immunity. And so that was the reason that it was remanded. Um, I don't think it's fair that the state would get to all of a sudden um, come up with new reasons that the fees should be reduced um, upon the remand order. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about that's really important is the court, this court gave one other important instruction. What do you make of the, the situation? You know, in you appealed an award, or the state appealed an award of $233,000, which you would have accepted uh, two years ago. And then you now get an award of $223,791, few, uh, a few dollars more, a few dollars less, maybe $10,000 less, and now you're appealing. After I mean, spending that, two more years working on the case. That, but that seems, well, there's only $7,000 worth of stuff according to the, 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 the fee thing. But that seems sort of uh, disingenuous to me. You know, it's also worth noting that if the state had simply paid the judgment to begin with in 2007, um, it would have been out a total of $442,000. And now it's looking at liability for over 600000 at the very minimum. Um, all because it continued to appeal um, the rulings um, in the case. We would have been perfectly happy accepting $74,000 when this trial got done 10 years ago. Um, that's the amount that we had fairly earned. But the law is clear that when the plaintiff is making arguments that any reasonable lawyer would have made at the time, it doesn't matter that with 2020 hindsight, you know, if I had a crystal ball and could have known what the Supreme Court was going to decide in Coleman, maybe I would have done something differently. But none of us have a crystal ball. Could have better preserved the ex parte Young argument. I mean, you didn't make that until after we suggested it, right? I believe that we, we, we had set up the case so that we could make that argument. It just simply wasn't necessary at the time. Um, and I think that the, f the fact is the, the law of the case said that we, we did preserve that argument. Um, and I think it would be unfair to, to cut our fees now on um, a claim that we didn't. I, I, I agree. You should get your fees on the trial. The issue is, to me, the appeal. And then the, the other issue we've been talking about, which is the case is remanded and it comes back and the fee award is much, much higher than it was back when we remanded for consideration of a reduction. It doesn't come back higher, but what you're asking for is higher, I'm sorry. That's okay. The, the other main thing that I would like to talk, talk about, and I don't know how much time I'm gonna have left at the end, is the fact that this court specifically said that it was very important for the district court to keep in mind and to give credit for the public service that this um, opinion um, gave, and the court completely failed to do that. It did not mention that once. It did not um, give any consideration to the idea that um, we had um, helped change the law or that we had given a blueprint for how lawyers handle these cases 
or that we had um, basically given 50,000 or so state employees the chance to fully enforce their rights under the FMLA. That is a public service um, accomplishment that is not reflected at all um, by, by the court's order. Thank you. Thank you as well, counsel. Mr. Ranch. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The state does not begrudge Ms. Lee taking this appeal. Likewise, nor should she begrudge the state taking an appeal originally that it believed was totally warranted by the case law. Justice Mansfield, earlier you nailed it. Uh, a substantial award here is gonna happen regardless. State acknowledges that. But the three most important words in this appeal are abuse of discretion. That's not just a rote recitation. Can, can of I clear standard. something up before you start your argument? Sure. Is it my understanding that in the district court below, you did not contest the higher fee, the higher fee award being the starting point? That's incorrect. The state's resistance to the fee application says, at least in a footnote, maybe in the main text, that the rates exceed the uh, reasonable uh, rates for the attorneys involved. But you said your counsel, Mr. Peter Zalek, is that his name? I don't probably butchered it. Uh, the court asked him specifically at the hearing, I, in the court, in other words, if I understand your position, if I understand your position is 361,000 less 40%. And Mr. Peterowski said that is correct. And that's what you preserved in the district court in the hearing, that you started from the 361 and you just wanted 40% off it. So I don't know how you can st stay here uh, and, and sort of, you know, not tell the judge what your real position is and then try to argue something else here that the judge wasn't even contemplating because there was a long colloquy before this and, and, and uh, it was brought up, are you arguing about the amount? And you guys said no. You just want 40% off 361. Well, Your Honor, the state doesn't have to preserve anything because the state prevailed. The state's position, the state's But you took the position, that was right, and, and now we're gonna pull the rug out from the district court judge who, who had that very same question, and your counsel down below said that's the starting point. Is that fair to the district court? Well, even if you accept the 361 number, the 361 number is incorrect. The appendix, uh, the motion for the fee award, the actual request was 356. We've added $5,000 out of nowhere. Another place we've added $5,000 out of nowhere is in Lee 3, where, the dis where this court says, oh, the district court's original order was 78,000 and change back in 2007. That order is in the appendix here, page 35. The actual number is 73. So to get back to Justice Mansfield's point, that means the comparison is 228 two years ago to 223 now, the actual reduction is $4,300, give or take, that's not an abuse of discretion. The discretion is really the most important part. Lee three mentioned discretion half a dozen times at least. Hensley takes pains to reemphasize the discretion that district courts have. Let me, let me do this another way. Are you saying that we should affirm the district court award and leave yes. it at 283? 223. 223. 223, 7, or something. Correct. And you'd pay the money and we wouldn't see you ever again, at least in this case. <laughs> at least in this case, correct. Okay. <laughs> That's my position. The, the discretion um, to get back there in Hensley is reemphasized throughout. Even though Hensley wasn't a unanimous decision, that was a complete point of agreement. Well, but what do you make of this five-factor test that you know we've been talking about a little bit? The district court judge um, outlined five theories and divided, et cetera, and had attorney's fees as one of the factors in it. Um, um, not sure I like that, frankly. Um, in part, as counsel says, it had attorney's fees in it. The, 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 she didn't really prevail on attorney's fees. That didn't seem quite right. It seemed kind of mechanical. Um, Defend it if you if you'd like and say well, it's not that bad um, or maybe it doesn't matter um, But you understand the nature of my question, I think 
it, it's both. It's not that bad and it doesn't matter. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not that bad uh, because of the rate increase. Uh, the rate increase accommodates the delay in payment. The rate increase accommodates the long slog that the plaintiff's attorneys had to go through to prevail in the case. Yeah, but I wouldn't, I mean, just to be blunt, I wouldn't do a discount for her failure to get attorney's fees. I mean, I don't think. But if the discount were um, not prevailing on immunity, 40%, that would be within the zone of discretion. Well, here's, the, here's the problem. I mean, I, I, there's two issues, and I would just say it's a good thing the state's not applying for fees in this case because we certainly would have some issues with how the states handled this litigation over the many, many years. But as I read the resistance below, there was an objection to the increased rates, but it was not a highlight. And it doesn't seem like that's what the district court relied on in docking the 40. And so can we, can we uh, affirm the district court uh, as, as not abusing its discretion when for really a rationale that wasn't expressed in the district court's uh, decision or or do we need to go off and do something separate on our own which seemed to be what both parties are inviting. You can affirm it on that ground because it was raised below. Uh, I, I grant you that it wasn't a highlight of what was raised below but it, but it was. That's a pretty common feature of this court's case law that you can affirm the district court on, on grounds that were raised below. Even if you go off and do your own, do your own thing, uh, I also grant you that's a request both parties have made. You would have to cabinet, of course, appropriately to say this is, this is a limited circumstance thing because of the length of this case. Normally we remand, we let the district court have the first crack at it. Just in this case, we're not gonna do it. But even if you go there, you can take the rates, you can uh, just say, we'll take the award we did previously and we'll just cut off 5,000 bucks, we'll just cut off 4,000 um, bucks. You can blue pencil every line and say, when you block bill 15 hours and just say research and correspondence, uh, we don't know what that is. You can adjust rates for individual attorneys. Um, you can say, uh, this should have been an equitable case. All of the voir dire prep and all of the jury instruction prep were ultimately, uh, should have been unnecessary. Uh, there's, there's lots of things you can do. I asked you a question about the mathematical formula. Mm -hmm. If you read Hensley, the, the U.S. Supreme Court rejects a mathematical approach comparing the total number of issues in a case with those actually prevailed. And the Eighth Circuit has actually applied that in Lash saying it was an abuse of discretion where the court did something similar to that. So why is it an abuse of discretion where the district court uh, said there's five claims, you prevailed on, on three, so we're going to do the mathematics? How, does, how do you get around, around the logic in those two cases, and, uh, Lash and Hensley? Hensley says the district court did not err in refusing to do that. That's because the district court below in Hensley took the fine tooth comb through the fee application and that's the way it chose to do it. There's Seventh Circuit authority, um, possibly some authority from this court that says when a, you're setting a fee award, uh, you don't necessarily have to do the fine tooth comb. Sometimes when you have a case such as this one where a lot of the work is factually interrelated, there's really no other way to do it uh, than to apply a percentage reduction. And so uh, the, the Hensley- Saying it's wrong to apply a percentage reduction. Because I think it's, it's an, there's two ways to do it. One, we can do an accounting method. We can go line by line. Or two, we can look at the, thing, the body of the work as a whole because things are interrelated. My, my specific question is that this judge used a percentage method based on the issues and claims. And it seems Hensley and Lash says you can't do that. And at Lash is Eighth Circuit and Hensley is Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger concern with those two cases is applying a percentage reduction based on the damages awarded. That's the primary concern in Rivera. I'm not going to say it's, it's absolutely not what Hensley was talking about, but that's the bigger concern. And last year was on, you know, there were so many parties and two didn't recover and the rest did. So they did a percentage there and they said that's not right. Sure. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the last case. I'm not sure either party has cited it. I have to take you at your word that that's what it says. Uh, but even so, um, if, if that leads you to conclude that this was an abuse of discretion, as stated in the state's brief, you, you do the work then. You can take the fine tooth comb. 
You can decide what rates to apply. You can decide how Guarantee much Guarantee it won't be a fine tooth comb. <laughs> That's you make it the public service claim that, that uh, council's raising. Yeah, they're there. Uh, <laughs> the district court take that into consideration. Absolutely. Uh, the district court, you have the full transcript of the district court hearing. That was raised before the district court. District court was well aware of, of that argument. It's, but it's not in his ruling, I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it's in the ruling, but it, it certainly was brought up. I, I don't think we can say that the district court was totally unaware of that assertion. Do you think there was a substantial public service or was it uh, uh, less than substantial? That's not my call to make. Why don't you help me make the call? Um, I mean, I, th I, I guess as a general matter, I think that's a fair factor and I think there's case law that supports it. Um, it's a it's kind of fuzzy factor. I mean, I'm not exactly sure that there's criteria, mm -hmm. um, but do you have anything at all to guide me in this particular case to suggest that it it sh you know might not be that great that this is a really fact specific uh, you know that's not likely to occur or any, any anything I, I guess I'll do we'll all do our best job otherwise but. Let me ask you what you mean by not likely to occur. I, I'm oh, well, unclear. I mean, uh, the, uh, if uh, the public service might be less if it was narrowly based on the facts and we're not likely to get other circumstances like it, and it's, this is just an unusual case and it doesn't really impact the law, it doesn't impact, I mean, she says 50,000 people. Um, uh, is this kind of a narrow case that doesn't have that much splash? Um, so we shouldn't take the public service all that seriously. Uh, any kind of argument you, you might have to, to discount um, a claim that it was a good thing they brought the litigation for the 50,000 people that they assert they're advancing. Sure, I think, I think at this point, uh, on this appeal, it's not a splashy case. The previous appeals were much more substantive. Well, let, me, and let me try and ask you a leading question on maybe you agree or disagree. It strikes me on, on the facts, uh, Lee ha had a, a good case and the clerk's office was doing wrong and on the facts, she was entitled to be vindicated and was vindicated. On the law, I'm not aware of a novel legal proposition that it really establishes. Is that fair? I think you've you've nailed it pretty well there. The the jury certainly determined, even though the, the this court ultimately said there shouldn't have been a jury uh, uh, trial uh, that that the per the Polk County Clerk of Court did wrong. Um, and but the, but the law ex parte young was there. That was maybe a little a little novel, but it's it's certainly wasn't a um, suggested by us, right? Suggested by you, uh, maybe in a, an attempt to be helpful. I I, I don't know. Uh, the, the case law generally, uh, Lee three said, consider the normal case law with, with respect to fee awards. When you do that, you look at fee awards not just under FMLA, you look at the Fair Labor Standards Act, you look at other civil rights litigation, Section 1988, you can look at other IO case law with mechanics liens and all of that. Uh, and f this case fits into that insofar as most district court fee decisions are affirmed on appeal, both on a challenge that uh, the, the award is inadequate and that the award is excessive. Uh, the recent cases cited in the Notice of Additional Authorities, those are additional cases where it's since the time we filed the briefs, those courts have said, hey, here's a percentage reduction and we, we consider the interrelatedness and we consider your partial success and this percentage, this percentage is okay. Um, Dotson is a specific Fourth Circuit FMLA case, 31% cut. Uh, McNally, this court, 2002, 24% cut within the district court's discretion. Equity control, 30% cut. Defendant said, that's not enough. You said, no, yeah, it definitely is enough. Vaughn, 25% cut. Affirmed over a challenge that it was still excessive. Lara, 75% cut. Affirmed. Um, this, this case really fits within What's those. the prevailing law on the issue of whether you update um, uh, the hour, hourly rates to the current year or instead leave them at the, uh, the rate they were at the time they did the work, and presumably that was related to their overhead at that time. 
I don't think there's law mandating a result either way. That, like any other portion of the calibration the district court does, is within its discretion. And I'm going to use the last 30 seconds here and make another pitch. Just if, if you do believe this was an abuse of discretion, if the district court picked the wrong number, you pick the number yourselves. Uh, again, that's a limited sort of uh, circumstance, and it, it, the opinion would have to be very carefully crafted to show that it was a limited circumstance. But I think Wooldridge, the 1997. There's case, case law that supports that. Sure. Okay. That, where you it's been up, up and down a few times, the, the court just does it to. <laughs> In either Another event, appeal. whether whether you affirm or whether you affirm as modified or remand with instructions for a specific amount, uh, this should be the last stop for this case. Thanks. Thank you as well, counsel. Rebuttal, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you. Um, the law is actually that the defendant um, not agreeing with a fee application is required to set for specific um, time entries or expense entries that it thinks are wrong. The defendants completely failed to do that in this case. Um, that Hensley versus City of Davenport is a Court of Appeals case that, that held that. Um, once a percentage reduction is not necessarily um, a wrong way for the court to do it, but once the defendant failed to identify even any specific entries, um, I believe that the court discretion became narrow in the sense of it was required to use the time entries that we um, attributed to the claims for um, retrospective relief. Um, the, when the court figured those five ways, the five issues, and divided the case into those things, one glaring thing that it left out was liability. And that was, the, that was the big part of the case. That was all the case was about until after the district court um, judgment. Um, most of the fees prior to trial and during the trial were related to proving liability. Um, the other legal principle in, in fee awards is that the defendant is certainly allowed to put up a vigorous defense, and the, and the defendants did so in this case. But when they do and they lose, there is a piper that needs to be paid. Um, the individual issues, um, each side won some during the appeals, but none of the appeals um, were necessary except for the fact that the defendant brought them. And we would have lost everything our client never would have recovered a dime had we not made the arguments that we did and, and defended each of those appeals. Um, the plaintiff ended up recovering over $377,000. Um, she got her job back. She got IPERS credit so that she can retire in a couple years just like she was going to otherwise. Um, we literally gave life to the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution by working a remedy and, and um, we follow up on that. I, I, uh, Justice Apple and I were asking some questions to Mr. Ranch. So tell us w what makes this case special in terms of public importance, not just to Lee, but to everyone, others out there. And, and it's not even limited to the state of Iowa, but this was, because the case was going on before Coleman and got, got decided during this whole thing, this is one of the very first cases, if not the very first case in the nation, where somebody came up with a way to enforce the self-care provisions of the Family Medical Leave Act against a state. Because Coleman said you can't do that um, and you know, whether it was this court's idea or whatever, we, we used Ex parte Young. I mean, I Pardon? Wasn't it clear in Coleman that prospective relief might be available? I mean, I, I seem to rec recall that. I, I probably. I mean, and, and we, I mean, we always contended that prospective relief was available. I mean, we got reinstatement. Um, but using Ex parte Young and using that as a means to enforce the self-care provision of the FMLA 
I believe was really groundbreaking, not just in Iowa, but all over the country. Um, I have a lot of contacts all over the country of people who do employment law, and it was a big deal. People could use this as a roadmap in order to help state employees who have to take leave because of their own serious health condition. And that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people in Iowa, and it's a lot of people all over the country. So I at least am very proud of that, of being able to, to have a case that, that breaks that ground and that um, explains how you do that so that other people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, is there a way to compensate lawyers who take on um, groundbreaking litigation or risky litigation and end up waiting years before the payday? Um, how do you compensate for the time value of money other than raising, um, updating the, the hourly rate to current levels? We cited a number of cases, I think particularly in our reply brief, if I'm not mistaken, of, of courts that use updated hourly rates as the way to do that. Um, there's also um, very, very few cases I've ever seen where they use a different way. Um, usually it's, I mean, I would, some courts have used interest as a way to do it, but they've also, that's been criticized um, among court decisions and among the research. Um, thank you, Your Honors. I see that my time is up. Appreciate your time. Ms. Fiedler, thank you as well. The case of Lee versus State is now then submitted and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.